by full Miss Marvel episode one video. There are so many Easter eggs, connections to all the Marvel phase four movies, Avengers Endgame, pretty much everything in the MCU right now. And there's a couple Easter eggs for other big stuff like She-Hulk. And there's even a big direct connection to the events of Spider-Man No Way Home, which just happened. So I will explain everything. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the episodes. We're doing a Disney Plus giveaway for memberships. All you have to do to enter is just be a subscriber and leave your favorite Easter egg from the episode on the video. Careful for spoilers. If you haven't seen the episode yet, I'll just start at the beginning and we'll work our way through scene by scene talking about Easter eggs, big connections, WTF moments as we go along. Kamala Khan is a relatively recent character to be introduced in Marvel Comics. She debuted in 2013 during Captain Marvel number 14. The way they did the series is they treated it more like the tone and the vibe of Spider-Man Homecoming, like it feels a lot like Spider-Man Homecoming with her in school. And for obvious reasons, there are many Easter eggs and direct connections with characters from Spider-Man No Way Home, Spider-Man Far From Home, and Spider-Man Homecoming. She's located in Jersey City on the other side of Manhattan from where Spider-Man is. So she's way closer to the events of WandaVision in Westview, so she'd know all about that. But the big change they've made to her in the comics is that in the comics she's actually an inhuman and they just kind of reintroduced that during Doctor Strange 2 with Black Bolt showing up. Thank you very much. But because they don't exist on the main Earth of the MCU right now, they've decided to change her powers to make them more similar to Captain Marvel's and Monica Rambeau's so that during the Captain Marvel 2, the Marvel's movie, they all work a little bit better on screen together. That's why her power looks a little bit more like the energy coming off of Monica Rambeau during WandaVision. The way they're explaining her powers too is that she's using what seems like the Kree version of the Negabands, which is a callback to the first version of Captain Marvel, the Marvel character. They convert mental energy into physical energy. So the real shorthand is that she has Green Lantern powers, but the big difference is that as you can see later in the episode, they leech energy from other electrical devices to power themselves up. The reason they have them do that is so that when she's standing next to Captain Marvel, who's kind of like a cosmic power battery, she has a near infinite energy source to power them up so she can continue being a superhero for much longer when she's fighting with Captain Marvel. Originally in the comic, she debuted as an Inhumans character. Her powers were activated when Thanos set off a Terrigen bomb of the mist in New York City. Just like on the TV show, she was an Avengers fangirl. She wrote a lot of her own Avengers fan fiction. She was a big Captain Marvel stan. So when she got her power, she was wearing a Captain Marvel costume and eventually wound up changing that to her own version that you see and she'll eventually get during the series. The actress in real life said that she grew up being a Marvel stan, so she's watched all the Marvel movies. She's just as big a fan as anyone else. She even tried to work in a bunch of Iron Man Easter eggs and references to all the episodes, but Kevin Feige said, no, 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 don't do that. We want her to be more of a Captain Marvel fan, like the comics. She also said that she tried to work in a bunch of Inhumans Easter eggs during the episodes too, like she was trying to get Lockjaw, the dog, into the episodes, I think as a stuffed animal in her room, because she has a lot of stuffed animals and Avengers merch all over the place. Kevin Feige also vetoed that just because they weren't ready to introduce actual Inhumans in the MCU in this way. She also said that she got into arguments with Kevin Feige about whether or not the real MCU is actually the 616 universe as canonized by the Doctor Strange 2 movie, thinking that it was still the classic Earth-19999. It sounds like way back when Marvel TV became a really huge thing with Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. after the first Avengers movie, she became a huge stan of those characters too. The actual episode title is Generation Y, which is meant to be a reference to Miss Marvel Volume 2 by G. Willow Wilson, one of the creators of the character. They based most of the story of the actual series on her run of the Miss Marvel character. Generation Y is also meant to be a reference to her letter Y generation, differentiating her from the older Avengers Marvel characters like the Marvel Phase 1 heroes, even though Thor is over 1500 years old. Most of them, except for like Nick Fury for instance, are Gen Xers. The whole Generation Y in the context of the MCU is just meant to be like the next group of heroes to come along, like the Young Avengers, because it does sound like they're building up to a Young Avengers team eventually, introducing all those different characters from the comics in different series. They play that same song by The Weeknd from the early trailers over the Marvel Studios title sequence and they give it a new upgrade to the standard Marvel Studios logo like there's some new footage incorporated from the recent series and movies and they also give her a fully custom version of the Marvel Studios logo like they've done for some of the Disney Plus series. They feature footage of Captain Marvel more prominently because of obvious reasons. The brand new footage that they put in is from Doctor Strange 2. This is right out of the trailers with him opening the Eye of Agamotto. There's even a brand new scene from Moon Knight in the letters here at the end too. The custom homemade looking version of the logo with the paper mache version in the person's hands is meant to be her, is meant to be part of her Avengers fan films that she creates for her YouTube channel. But this is meant to give you some context for the character and why she's such a fangirl of Captain Marvel because during the series, especially during this episode, they make a lot of references and jokes to the fact that nobody actually knows that much about Captain Marvel because she's never around. 
She calls this the final chapter in her 10-part series on Captain Marvel. She calls her Earth's Mightiest Hero. That's the phrase used in the classic Avengers comics, Earth's Mightiest Heroes. Funny connection to Thor Love and Thunder on Thor's trucker hat when he's getting all swole. It's got the classic Avengers logo and comic book phrase on it, with him writing over it in Sharpie saying Strongest Avenger. Pretty much all the logos in this referencing anything going on with any character related to any of the movies or the Disney Plus series is based on comic book font. But basically her final episode here that she's created is the Avengers Endgame final battle. And when she says it's the conclusion of a 10 part series, it's a clever reference to the end of the Infinity Saga of movies because we're in Marvel Phase 4 now. Just to chart this series in the timeline, this takes place about two years after Avengers Endgame. There are references later in the series during her gym class to it being the year 2025. There's also a reference on her desktop to something coming up in September, so it's meant to be like in August, like the very beginning of the school semester. She's also a junior in high school, she's 16 years old, so she's about as old as Spider-Man was during Far From Home. There's a version of Hela here, there's also a brunette version of Captain Marvel, this could be a depiction of her because she's like the only brunette Miss Marvel that I've ever seen before. You notice in the background there's a bunch of doodles on white paper, this cat here is just meant to be Goose, the Flurkin, not an actual cat. But this is actually one of the depictions of Carol Danvers as Miss Marvel before she started calling herself Captain Marvel, just to sort of foreshadow Kamala Khan becoming Miss Marvel. But in the context of the MCU, nobody on this earth has ever used the term Miss Marvel when talking about Carol Danvers. It's like a brand new concept. Throughout this too, all the depictions of the characters are all based on comic book designs. It's the same thing around her room too. It's all Captain Marvel comic book art. And when we get to the Avengers con later, I'll point that out too because it's basically wall to wall Easter eggs with a bunch of comic book art. The Sloth with the Wings is a reference to her Sloth Baby Productions YouTube channel name. This Captain Marvel artwork is a combination of modern artwork along with classic Jack Kirby artwork like you see the Kirby crackle here. This MS Paint version of Captain Marvel is meant to be an old school computer joke because it's a free version of the software that you don't have to pay for like Adobe or other more complicated artwork programs. So if you use PCs back in the 90s or the early 2000s, you probably used a version of MS Paint at one point. We learned that Scott Lang started his own podcast after Avengers Endgame in the MCU called Big Little Me, which is a big Ant-Man pun, talking about the Avengers, quantum energy, being Ant-Man in general, his adventures with the other Avengers characters. The title, This Powered Life, is also a play on the NPR podcast, This American Life. This is more of her during the Battle of Avengers Endgame going up against Thanos' ships. The Circle Q logo is just foreshadowing Bruno's family's business. They run the corner store. It's sort of like their version of Mr. Delmar's bodega during the Spider-Man movies. When she calls her a well-coiffed hero, she's joking about Captain Marvel's mohawk from the comics, which they've done in the movies a couple times. They also depict her with a couple different comic book haircuts. I believe the KO joke that she uses here, like the audio, is directly taken from Street Fighter 2 game, like Kamala Khan in real life just borrowed audio from Street Fighter 2 for this. Then when she's guessing what Captain Marvel has been doing while she's been in deep space and Kree scroll space all these years, they play a bunch of classic sci-fi footage, this alien is just meant to be a funny twist on comic book saves, she depicts her having a bunch of adventures with other aliens, it's meant to be Kevin Feige just cleverly winking, revealing what's actually been going on in the MCU, just filling in that backstory. Then she references the Avengers Con, which is like the in-universe version of Comic-Con, but just for Avengers stuff. And this is meant to be the inaugural year. This sign that reads Carol Core is an actual thing in real life in the fandom. She says one of her next videos is going to be about how she thinks Thor is secretly a gamer, which is actually correct because we saw Avengers Endgame. It's a big joke on that new master Fortnite scene. When she says a new episode drops every Wednesday, that's a big Disney Plus joke because Marvel drops their episodes on Wednesdays. This scene is just depicting her family and friends. You could say this person wielding the sword is an Eternals Black Knight Camelot reference too, just because it's so different from a lot of the other references that she makes in her fan films. All of her recent videos are meant to be sort of clever updates on the Marvel Phase 4 timeline, like things that have been happening in the past couple of years in the MCU. Like before her Carol Danvers video, there's a video about Ant-Man and the Wasp vacation in Paris. It's meant to tell you literally what they did after the events of Avengers Endgame. Like we see what you're doing here, Kevin Feige, giving us all this backstory. This is like the most expensive exposition fan film ever. The video beneath it, bitten by a radioactive feminist, is a Spider-Man joke on the actual spider bite. Then some of you actually recognize some of these YouTube jokes, like there's a spammer in her comments trying to pretend to be a normal commenter, scamming people, getting them to link away to a website where they'll give their personal information. There's a comment from her best friend Bruno who left a comment a couple days ago. 
and I can't see all of her video titles on the right rail here, but these would all be other Marvel Phase 4 references too, to like big things that are happening in the universe right now. There's a big joke about her taking her driving test and it just going terribly. They say they wrote the series in the tone of Spider-Man Homecoming with the same vibe, but also when they were doing Spider-Man Homecoming, they filmed him taking his driver test for an Audi ad. The t-shirt she's wearing is an in-universe Avengers shirt joking about the Wasp, Valkyrie, and Captain Marvel are wearing eyeglasses. Then when she crashes the car and they play the title scenes for the Miss Marvel series, these are all titles based on the Miss Marvel comic book titles. They have this whole thing during the episode where they show her daydreaming, but they show you what she's seeing with Captain Marvel in fan art flying by. Her mother starts yelling at her about daydreaming and then references Kamala's grandmother saying that she's just like Kamala, setting up everything that's going on with the Kree negabands in the new powers that she gets. They make it sound like her grandmother will be a bigger thing in the series like she used to wear the bracelet and use the powers back in Pakistan where their family came from. When they take her to school in the morning, all the names on the plaque here are people who actually worked on the real life Miss Marvel comics. G. Willow Wilson helped create the character, Stephen Wacker, Jamie McKelvey, all these people, all Marvel comic book writers and comic book artists. And during school, there are actually several moments that are very similar to Spider-Man homecoming moments with him at school. Like she's trying to get her books for chemistry class, we saw Spider-Man in his chemistry class making new webbing. This is Bruno from the comics, he's her best friend. It sounds like they're doing a relatively comic book accurate story for him, but also incorporating some more tech based stuff to his character. They set up this whole subplot with a Zoe character who's kind of like her frenemies in a mean girl kind of way who shows up later. I think she's going to be like the Flash Thompson to her Peter Parker. So she'll act terribly to Kamala Khan, not really caring about her, but she'll secretly wind up being a stan of this new mystery Miss Marvel character without knowing that it's actually Kamala Khan. Her guidance counselor, Gabe Wilson, is named for the comic book creator, G. Willow Wilson. And when they have the big joke about planning her future and he starts quoting Mulan, they actually use the same film technique that they used during the Mulan movie when they split the screen. When they're at the Circle Q, Bruno references Darth Vader, and I think this is the second character outside of Spider-Man in the MCU to directly reference a specific Star Wars character or movie. Then when they're brainstorming different versions of the Captain Marvel costume and mashups of different characters, they also pass a building named Green Co, another Hulk reference. There are many during the series. They reference a mashup of Captain Marvel and Black Panther, Iron Man, Captain Marvel, Doctor Strange, calling them Captain Panther, Iron Marvel, Doctor Strange Marvel. There were actual comic books when they did stuff like this. Like there was a comic book where Captain Marvel tried to actually learn magic from Doctor Strange. The big comic book team up between Captain Marvel and Black Panther is literally happening in the Ultimates comics. But also in real life, fans do this all the time, mashing up different versions of characters together to create something a little bit cooler. She references Valkyrie wearing a cape and the winged horse that we see during the Thor Love and Thunder trailer. Also, Asgard in present day is a much more common tourist attraction for the rest of the world. They make a joke about a princess mashup with Captain Marvel with her wearing a tiara that they pay off later in the episode. She makes a Marvel Zombies joke about zombie Captain Marvel. They did Marvel Zombies during What If. We're going to get What If Season 2 so we might see them again. They kind of had a Marvel Zombies Easter egg during Doctor Strange 2 and they were also making a completely separate spin-off series about Marvel Zombies for next year. This upside down shot is her watching an episode of the Felicity TV show which is a bit of a deep cut but it's of two of the protagonists having their very first kiss. It's meant to be a reference to her and Bruno's relationship. The way they set the two of them up is that they'll probably eventually become a couple by the end of the series. Then when she discovers these Kree negabands from her grandmother's box, they rotate the camera around. It's meant to mirror the scene of her activating her powers later in the episode of the Avengers convention when the camera spins around again. The writing on the band, the symbols, the energy seem like they're very Kree themed. Her grandmother is still alive. Like I said, it sounds like there's going to be some backstory here with explaining how it is that she got her hands on Kree technology like this. And as I said, they're designed based on the original Captain Marvel, Marvel's negabands from the comics. They do a bunch of errands in their version of Little Pakistan touring all the shops and the restaurants. Them cutting the meat off the spit here is another clever Avengers reference to the shawarma post credit scene. Another big Spider-Man reference here too, the street food vendor mentions vultures. When he talks about vultures in Armani suits though, that might turn into an actual bigger plot in the series. But the actual MCU vulture himself just got teleported to the Morbius Venom universe in the Morbius post credit scene. The Bruno character seems kind of like a dumpster diver in the same vein as Spider-Man and Iron Man. He's the one who makes the Photon gloves for her costume later. Photon also a big reference to Monica Rambeau's name that she used during the comics. 
They do have a small montage of her creating her cosplay version of the costume using the sash meant to be like the classic Miss Marvel costume. Eventually she will make her own comic book accurate version of the upgraded costume too. The funny thing about this Hulk scene with her parents trying to get her to dress up like the Hulk is that she goes full fangirl which is very much a thing in real life like you're not doing it correctly. There is no little Hulk in real life. The closest thing we actually have to a little Hulk would be like the smaller in stature She-Hulk which is actually going to debut episodes in August so it's a bit of a clever reference to that. But she's not exactly little she's like 8 feet tall when she's hulked out. Like I said in the background of this gym scene they kind of chart the timeline for you like there's a big gap between 2019 and 2023 because that's basically when the snap took place. On the far right you see the 2024 pendant that's for last year's season meaning this year is 2025. So this is like the furthest forward we've been in the Marvel Phase 4 timeline besides Doctor Strange 2 and the events of Thor Love and Thunder. When she's going through her elaborate montage of how they're going to get into the Avengers convention and sneaking at the house she does a big superhero landing which she later fails big time. On the bus this girl's dressed like one of Captain America's girls from his USO shows. This guy is wearing an actual Captain America costume with a shield. The one on the right is dressed like Scarlet Witch in Avengers Age of Ultron. They have a super quick montage of Bruno's Instagram account of them taking pictures with all the different characters. You see him dressed up like a version of Iron Man. The girl behind them with the white hair and the braid seems like more of an Asgardian reference but if Storm would have already debuted in the MCU I'd say without the braid she looks way closer to a version of Storm. But like because this is meant to be a convention for Marvel Avengers characters everyone is dressed as some version of a Marvel character like Nick Fury, Vision, these girls are even dressed like Iron Man's girls from Iron Man 2 when he was on stage. You also notice when she's going through her upstairs storage there's a bunch of stuff from her childhood like she used to be in the Girl Scouts. There's also a childhood Captain America drawing that she made. In the comics it was actually Captain America that told Carol Danvers she should start calling herself Captain Marvel. It seems like the way they're explaining the Kree band's power is that they actually siphon energy from light. Like when the light above starts flashing it's like they're powering themselves up. When the flashes start going off in her face later in the episode they really power up the bands. I think they're doing it that way so that when she's on screen with Captain Marvel who's like this giant cosmic battery she will have an infinite energy source to power up her bands. Then like I said the actual convention is like wall to wall references. There are a billion here that you could just pick out so I'm just going to talk about some of the bigger ones. Camp Lehigh is where Captain America got the super soldier serum in the first movie. Later in the timeline in the 1970s they visited there during the Avengers Endgame time heist. It's also where Arnim Zola was hiding out in the computers during Winter Soldier. The Hulk entrance that they have here is designed based on classic Hulk comic book art. And inside they're playing the theme song from the 1940s Captain America USO shows tour. Wall to wall around the convention they have different booths based on different events for different Avengers characters. Like there's a giant Hulk area, there's a Black Widow, an Iron Man standee, a giant Viking Thor area for Asgardians. You see Doctor Strange in the background. I mean it's a convention so it's literally every Avengers character you could imagine. I did not spot though, this is interesting, I did not spot a bunch of Spider-Man stuff specifically like no depictions of him in the costume around this. The funny thing about this Avengers con too is that Kevin Feige said they had so much fun making this for the series they might actually start doing it in real life. They have a big Guardians of the Galaxy area. There's another green woman in the background cosplaying Hulk. Another reminder that they're doing She-Hulk episodes later this summer like oh by the way we're going to be having this other series coming really soon too. They have a joke about America's ass with Captain America's butt. The Ant-Man and the Wasp table is actually using the real life logo from the Marvel movie. They even have a tribute wall for the dead Avengers characters like Black Widow and Iron Man. People have also hung up tributes to their own loved ones here and references to other major events like this one is yelling about the Sokovia Accords. Someone is trying to sell a book that they wrote based on the life of Peter Quill. The title Starboy story is just a play on the idea that nobody knows or remembers that he's calling himself Star-Lord. Like who? Who are you? What's your name? All the comic book covers here are based on actual comics. They have the iconic Captain America phrase, I can do this all day. The vendor is even dressed like an actual ant for Ant-Man's worker ants. All these pamphlets that the Black Panther themed character is handing out are travel brochures for visiting Wakanda. They even have a giant installation depicting the events of Ant-Man and the Wasp with him going to giant man form in the bay. When she's staring at the Captain Marvel booth the Captain Marvel theme song starts playing and then her frenemy Zoe shows up in a non-canonical version of the costume that triggers her and they turn it into that big thing like I said the big Flash Thompson joke about her not caring about Kamala Khan but loving this new mystery Miss Marvel character. When Bruno tells her it's her time to shine literally he's talking about the photon gloves but also she literally shines when she's using her power of the Nega bands. Then the big easter egg that you probably spotted here is for Agent M. So in real life Agent M has been working for Marvel making videos for them on their main channel for a long time. 
So if Marvel really started doing these conventions, he would actually be doing this in real life. When she comes back, Bruno says that he's dressed as Bruce Banner, and even though it just seems like he's a normal person wearing a lab coat, he's wearing the same types of flannel-looking shirts that Bruce Banner wears. Also right next to them, you see the woman cosplaying She-Hulk, just another Easter egg for the She-Hulk episodes later this summer. When she puts the bangle on, it expands and covers her arm a little bit more, you see the same type of cosmic energy flow around her that you saw coming off of Monica Rambeau. When the camera spins around and you get that background shot that looks like a flashback to a bunch of aliens, it seems like a bunch of Kree that are connected to one of the trailer scenes of people back in Pakistan walking single file. It might have something to do with what was going on with her grandma. And like I said, the reason the band's power activates is because it's leeching power from all the light that's being given off around her. That's why it's only after all the camera flashes start going off that she accidentally activates the power. And just like classic Spider-Man fashion, she also creates the mess that winds up leading to her having to save the Zoe character. Like, she's actually responsible for that happening in the first place. In the same way that Spider-Man causes a lot of the problems that he winds up having to solve during his movies. The actual end credits for the episode are meant to be a bunch of graffiti and art for things during the series all around Jersey City, but pretty much every panel that you see here is based on an actual Miss Marvel comic book panel. They even have references to her inhuman stretchy powers in the comics. She uses the word embiggen when she's doing that, so we'll see if she uses that later in the series too. Then surprisingly, they have an actual post credit scene for those of you that were disappointed that Moon Knight didn't really have a ton of post credit scenes. This time, it's a damage control scene with the same characters that we just saw during Spider-Man No Way Home, seeing footage of her powers and investigating. The reason why the footage glitches out on the phone of the person's upload is because of the effect of the Negaband siphoning off that camera's power. So during episode two, it's all about them trying to haul her in to question her about her abilities. There'll be six episodes total. We'll also get some She-Hulk trailers for this while this is going on too. Also, we just got a brand new Thor Love and Thunder trailer video. That will be my next video to post later today. There are a billion other Easter eggs during the episode, so you could watch it like 50 times and still find new stuff. If there's anything big that you saw that I didn't talk about during the video, just write it below in the comments. My full Miss Marvel episode 2 video will post next Wednesday. It should be back to a relatively normal schedule now that things aren't quite so crazy. While you wait for everything, everyone click here for my full Obi-Wan Kenobi episode 4 video in Easter eggs, and click here for that brand new Black Adam trailer video in Easter eggs. Thank you so much for watching, everyone stay safe, and I'll see you guys in the next one.